Sorry, I better hurry. Yep, yep. Okay, let's go on into this. Okay. So the madam's office, which there would have been a oh no, one of my co-workers was probably <laughs> It's beautiful. It's beautiful, but it's it's, it's belong here. <laughs> John back to one of the workrooms that was there. There they would discuss the business. And so after 19, in 1969, it was $20, 20 minutes straight up sex. After that, you negotiated. Uh, and so she'd write down exactly what he wanted, the price that they had agreed upon, and then she'd write down the bills that he was using because this madam was not about to be shortchanged. And then before she started working, she'd come in here, put it in her slot. Rarely would we accept checks unless we knew who your great aunt's mother's name when where your family lived. Anyway, you had to be a regular to get a check. And there she would put her cash, the bills in there, and then away she'd go back to work and push that timer. Uh, at the end of the night, the madam would come in here, unlock this drawer, and she'd count the stash of cash. When everything matched the bills on here, it'd be 50 for the gal, 50 for the madam. Now that sounds like a cut slanted towards the madam, but when you think about it, she's paying for room and board year round. She has to keep this place going. Doctor's visits twice a week during hunting season, food, a housekeeper, oh. you name it. Uh, entertainment in the parlor during deer hunting season, but also bail money. And one of the madams would have an interesting place of hiding the bail money. She'd have two vacuum cleaners, one that worked and one that didn't. And the one that didn't had $5,000 cash. And if she ever got raided and with those local police ha having their sticky fingers, she'd take that bag out of that vacuum cleaner and away she'd go either to just save it or to bail her gals out. Wow. Uh, every madam would have, would have a safe and uh, in it she'd have guns, address books and documents, plus lots of cash. And that right there, that dresser, was Pam Holiday's. That was in the purple door. Uh -huh. She had a very expensive taste. Oops, excuse me. She had very expensive taste. And she would wear a white fur mink coat around town. And she was very elaborately dressed to just, and she'd be dressed scantily. And mm, that was against the rules too. Yeah, we're going to talk more about her in the next room, but FYI, we're going to be passing two vacuum cleaners, two vacuum and cleaners. one of them doesn't work. <laughs> okay, all right, that's where the pillow yep, goes. Yep. I was wondering where that pillow went to. So, um, yes, interesting. So there she wow. is in all her glory. You might want to get your video. Is Madame Mustachio, yes. It was a mustache. She was French, right? And uh, in her early 20s, she had a divorce, and it was very uh, nerve-wracking on her. And so she was so stressed out that her hair grew especially fast and at that short amount of time, and she decided to never shave it after that. By the way, the men of Deadwood would come to her for business advice, not because she was so smart. She had run brothels in other states like Arizona. And you wanted to work for her because you could make a lot of money working for her. Wow. And ironically, they had a lot of, m many people respected her. I guess she held her own with the men because she had a mustache and she was a very smart businesswoman. Huh. Then there's Dora DeFran who said, you can't run a sporting house on creek water. Doesn't she look like she said that? Yep. Uh, well, she and her husband Joe had a string of brothels all throughout the Black Hills, including over in Belle Fouche called Didlin Doris. She passed away in 1934, and she's buried next to her husband, Joe, and her pet parrot, Fred. She was quite colorful and very rich. Uh, down here is Poker Ellis Tubbs. She was a little spitfire. She was known to be a better poker player than a brothel, a madam, but she did take out a two-year bank loan down in Sturgis, and she paid it back within one year. And the Bank of Sturgis goes, Alex, the Grand Army of the Republic was having an encampment. I knew that the... State Oaks was in town, but I plumb forgot about those Methodist preachers having a church conference. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. Uh, so these three caricatures up here yeah, yeah. are the last three madams standing. And up 
Down here at the bottom corner is Tommy Cox. She's the madam of the beige door. We don't know much about her. She comes sometime in the 60s. Over here to the far right is Dixie Fletcher. She's a hot-headed Irish woman with a heart of gold. She's young in 1943, and her husband dies in World War II, so she becomes a brothel worker, only going to do it for a couple of years, but she ends up liking it, makes a lot of money, and learns tricks of the trade along the way, and she becomes a madam of many brothels throughout her career, including the last two, the, two of the last four, the white door and the green door. She's the madam of the beige door, and of course, she takes that brown door and paints it purple. And uh, she's, she comes in 1975. She's 44, and she's from Montana, newly divorced. So what do you do? You become a sex worker. Woo-hoo, celebrate. Anyway, so she's the madam next door, and she's a rule breaker. She's wild. She's crazy. And you know those uh, set of rules that all the madams follow? Oh, well, guess what? She doesn't follow them. And also... She uh, takes a liking to cocaine and barbiturates, which makes for bad business decisions. Yes, and uh, she bragged about how much she made and the fact that she didn't have to pay taxes. Uh-oh, that really ticked her off. By the way, it was said if you had any problems, you didn't go to the police, you went to Dixie. Really? Yeah, she was a pretty tough, tough broad. Yep, she had a lot of power in this town, lots of money. Anyway, so Pam Holiday gets really cozy with the outlaw biker gang, the Banditos. They're very dangerous in the 70s. And it's rumored that the Purple Door is their hideout. Well, that's going to, you know, hurt everybody in the end. But before we talk about that, there's a murder that was committed in 1978. A body is found in Boulder Canyon that leads to Sturgis. His name is Walter Morton, and the way it's done, rumor is it was mafia. And it was also rumored that the mafia was trying to elbow its way into the brothels in Deadwood. Well, on Walter Morton's body is found cherry-flavored douche. And it is a well-known fact that all of Pam's girls used cherry-flavored douche. Dun, dun, dun. How's that for forensics evidence? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So uh, now we've got two South Dakota DCI agents coming around investigating mostly Pam's Purple Door, but these doors, they could care less about the brothels. They're looking for the mafia being involved. They're looking for stolen goods, uh, breaking of liquor laws, etc. They And it was rumored that one of those DCI agents goes missing forever. <gasps> So they just let go of that investigation because I think they found out that there were people high in power that were involved. So they just let it go. Wow. So a year later, another murder has been committed. This time it's 1979 down in Texas. U.S. District Judge John Wood. Well, the Banditos hired a hitman, Charles Harrelson, Woody Harrelson's biological father, and they hired a hitman to shoot that judge. Well, it was rumored that that murder weapon was being hinted at any any guesses the purple door right next door in fact oh, Pam, naughty 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 again so now we've got the local feds coming around and they're investigating it. it's called operation hotbed and so they're <laughs> coming around and they're interviewing these two plus the shared uh housekeeper and also sex workers, and they're spilling their guts, right? Well, on the morning of May 21st, 1980, two FBI vans pull in the Badland region. They get out and they...